Okay, there we go. Hi everyone, how's it going? Jim here, and this is another episode of BXJS, a show about building things with JavaScript. And today, by your request, we're going to be talking about setting up your own server. Um, before we get to the meat of it, so to say, I want to do a small side note, let's put it this way, and uh, say that there is now a um, donate button using PayPal in the Twitch description, as well as the YouTube description of this video and every video from now on, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, because you guys wanted that. I honestly don't know why you want to give me money, but uh, let me just say that if you have a spare money, if you're not in dread need of money and you basically think that I have um, contributed to your learning experience or basically have been useful to you, I will be happy to accept any donations that you have, but know this, I will most likely spend this on video games. So if you're okay with that, I'm good with, a, you know, just throw them at me. So yes, uh, if you want to support this stream, not by just following and, you know, retweeting, participating in Discord and uh, helping other people, then you can now support it using PayPal. Uh, and I will be forever grateful if you do that. You have been warned and given the information. So let's get cracking and let's get uh, to setting up our own server. So I thought that basically we could either go with... Um, Using a third party server, like get it from DigitalOcean, Scaleway or whatever, the hosting provider, but that would mean that we have sort of a better version of it, right? Because most of those providers actually have base images that are more or less already configured and you only need to do like minor tweaks. So what I did instead is I have here a virtual box that is running a Debian server, which is basically bare bones. So there's like nothing installed on it aside from the sudo and basic user, right? So I configured it to be available at debian.vm for me. So we can actually go into it using SSH. And as you can see, there's like, you know, uh, there's only sudo right now, which I configured to work for Yamalite. It works with the password and there's, that's it, right? So I can, I can go to the roots, but I don't think I can actually connect as a root, which is a neat little um, security uh, option. So yeah, it doesn't work actually. So uh, if you have a server, some providers do give it out to you with the root as a default user, then the first thing you should do is you should create your own user and never use root anymore, right? So if you need to do something, do it with sudo and then don't touch it. Um, so basically this is the first step and it's a very, very basic one. So what we're going to do now is we're going to configure the SSH authentication because running login and password is first of all, not very secure because you can brute force a password. Second of all is not convenient, right? You have to enter your password every time, you have to remember it, you have to write it down somewhere, it's a pain in the ass. So what you can actually do, you can use um, public and private key authentication, right? So this is what is typically used and looks like we don't have an SSH folder. So I'm going to make dir.ssh on the server, right? I'm going to um, cd into it and I'm going to touch authorized keys, I believe, right? I'm going to wim it. So um, now you need your public key. So I'm going to increase the size of the font here. The, no, that's not what I want. Let me resize it a bit. So I'm going to cut my SSH, uh, no, not SBT, SSH um, ID. Yeah, I mean, we can go with ID ED. So I have a bunch of those, but uh, basically, they are more or less same. And I'm going to paste this key here. If you are interested in how to generate uh, public keys, um, then for example, GitHub has a very good uh, description for that. I think this, yeah, so this is the full guide basically from checking for existing to generating a new one, adding it to SSH agent if you're using the some other third party thing like, you know, the Windows Putty or whatever and using it for GitHub, but the same more or less the same way goes for the um, SSH connection, right? So now that we have it in authorized keys, if I exit, if I try to SSH again, I won't actually have to enter anything because it will use a key now. Um, hey, Dragon, uh, I've started a few minutes earlier. Yes, indeed, uh, you have not missed much. So I just started um, adding the authorization using SSH keys, but that's basically about it. 
Right, so once you enable SSH key authorization, what you wanna do is you wanna disable password authorization because you can still use password and brute force it, right? So what you wanna do is you wanna sudo vim, um, I believe it was ADC, is it an ADC? Man, I always forget where the configs uh, live. So sshd config. What you want is to find sshd config, which is under ADC, sshd, yes, ssh, okay, ssh, the config, there we go. So we are gonna edit this and say that authentication, um, public key authentication, yes, this is default, this is what we want. And then there should be password authentication, no, this is what we're gonna say, no, right? And I don't think at this point we actually need to change anything else. So that's all the other defaults are more or less fine. So basically we only wanna disable the password out here. There we go. So um, once again, if I try now, um, I think I can provide password here. Yeah, so um, no, that's ports. Uh, wait a second, how was the password? Stage password. I don't know if I remember that. Uh, automate, no, that's not what I, SSH login with clear text password as a parameter. I, it probably doesn't, oh no, it does. SSH, oh, there's an SSH pass thing, well, whatever. So basically, you will have to trust me, it won't allow logging in with password anymore, only with, um, we can actually try with the root, right? So we can exit and uh, do root because root doesn't have my key. It actually asks for password. I guess we have to restart the SSH daemon. Um, blah, 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 wait, no, just just go away thing. Um, how do I restart an SSH daemon? Seven permit login. Um, Da, 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 da. SSHD config, come on, how do I restart? I, like, I never remember any of this stuff. HD config restart, there we go. Uh, VI restart SSHD by following the following command, and the command is, of course, not, not here. Uh, uh, it's for whatever reason in German. Uh, services SSHD restart, yes, that should, no, not service, because this is probably. Which Linux server, that's a very generic so Linux server, okay. Uh, so what we need is Debian SSHD restart, right? Um, is it using systemd or not? Or is it um, ATC? Is it in ED? Yeah, okay. Um, SSH restart, right? Failed because I probably, um, no, it's system, is it systemd? MCTL. Start SSH. Um, was not provided by. Oh man, hell if I remember how that works. Okay, let's see. Where's my Where's my system now? Okay, maybe there's a. Um... How do I restart Unix? Yes, come on. Debian Ubuntu. Um, no, we need D used to work, but it's no longer the case, right? Uh, D. Man, system system D, I think it right. System D. No, I mean the stupidest case would be to just restart the server itself, but that is very not what we want to do, basically. Okay, but no, not not what I wanted to do. So we do the status. I'd be on job running. Okay, so that seems fine. And SSH service is there. So that's definitely the system D. And uh, system CTL restarts. Um, what's it called here? I, God damn it, should have, should have checked. Okay, so we have uh, system SSH.service. Okay. So system CTL restart. Yes, I have to do it with sudo, right? There we go, okay, so now if I exit and, and try to connect with roots, there you go. So now as you can see, the um, password login is no longer allowed, but when I try to log in with any of my private keys, it will just reject it because they are not in the root user. This is exactly what we want. Okay, so next thing is, um, while it is extremely hard to brute force um, SSH server with a public key, you can still do that. So. What you want to do is you want to actually um, install a utility that will protect you from brute force attacks. One of those, and uh, I think it's 
like one of the best ones and it's pretty uh, ubiquitous. So it not only works for SSHD, but as well for like HTTP demons and so on and so forth. It's called fail to ban. And uh, this is what we're gonna use. The cool thing about it is that it's actually very easy to install and configure. And there's probably a guide. There you go. There's a digital ocean guide for that. Uh, by the way, DigitalOcean has a really good uh, knowledge base of tutorials related to server configuration. So I recommend, uh, highly recommend looking at it. So get install, fail to ban. I believe you don't really need to do much actually in terms of configuration. So yes, we're going to install it. It's a Python based package, works by analyzing logs and essentially banning whatever IP addresses are trying to do the same thing over and over again. It's a very stupid approach, but hey, works pretty well. Okay, so uh, next thing we need to, um, so they copy the config to local, from local, right? Uh, yeah, why not? Let's, let's do this. We can just do this. Uh, are you, no, what I, okay. Once copied, yeah, so we just copy the local example config. No, no, I don't want, no, no, I want my vim. There you go and uh, ignore ip we don't really need ignore ip right so let's see uh, ignore ip i mean okay the default one localhost is obviously this is something we want ban time 600 seconds that means like 10 minutes i guess it's okay so let's see uh i think the defaults are more or less sensible we don't really need anything else right so this is default so you can configure emails, yes, if you want to be notified about the attacks. In our case, we don't really care. And it looks like we can just leave it by default, right? So it doesn't seem, doesn't seem like we care about it. The defaults seem to be sensible. So now, because we have failed to ban installed, it will automatically detect those attempts to break into the system essentially and prevent them. By the way, let me just quickly disable my notifications so that I don't get spammed by that stuff. Um, there we go. Okay. So now we have the server, we have uh, fail to ban, we have SSH access to it, which is does not require our, us entering passwords. Problem, another problem is that we do need a password for Zudo right now, which is slightly annoying, right? So um, you might wanna do that anyway in some circumstances, but I personally, since most of the servers that I use are, um, uh, managed by people that I trust, essentially, what I do is I typically say, wait, what? No password, yes, and uh, we save that. Yes, I want to override it, thank you very much. And uh, once you re-log in, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to run, oh, you want, okay, why? Um, uh, write sudors as a root on Debian. Uh, that's what I just screwed up. It is see Vim. Uh, no, it is see, right? There we go. Rep two Okay, let's say L. Okay, let's try Sue. So Vim two right? There we go. Okay, uh, oh, right. Uh, whoops. That's what was the problem. I think fix it. Just make the typo there. Pseudo echo one oh three. There we go. So now we have pseudo without password. Um there are, as I said, there are cases when you might not want that, but uh, once again, if you're managing server yourself and obviously you trust yourself, you can do that. And you know, if you have like fail to ban and public key authentication, there is nothing really to be afraid of because if someone gets inside, you're screwed anyway. So it's a nice convenience thing. All right, so we get that. So next thing is we need to set up our development environment or deployment environment, right? So uh, there's a lot of ways of doing it, obviously. You can set up Nginx and then Node.js and then pro process everything or pipe everything through that Nginx as a front end. But you, if you watched my previous live streams or videos, you might know that I'm a huge fan of Docker and um, this is the way I manage it. So I'm gonna show you how to set up a Docker, right? Or Docker-based deployment environment. Um, so we're gonna install Docker C on Debian, right? This is what we want, there we go. Um, the Docker has a decent docs on how to set up everything. So 
Um, we are gonna go ahead and install uh, whatever they suggest. Because there's like a bunch of um, libraries they want and headers and, and core, um, yeah, what do you call them? Like certificates and stuff, yeah. So basically we're just gonna go with that. Come on. Once this is installed, we're gonna pull the public key from their repository like this and add it to apt key. We're gonna make sure that the key is indeed correct. Uh, that looks fine, docker release, yes. And then we are gonna add their repository to our uh, apt config, right? Um, and I think that should be it. So because we're not using the uh, Wheezy, I believe, I believe we're only using the latest stable, which is, hell if I remember the name, stretch, right? And then we just install Docker, right? So it's it's just another package, it's installed with apps, no problems, no, uh, no magic here, essentially. If you ever use Linux, you should be able to do that yourself without too many problems, following this very guide, right? And uh, once we've done that, first thing we wanna do is we wanna test that it works. Come on. So yeah, obviously there are UI based solutions for managing servers, but I personally prefer command line. And I think this is the, basically gives you more control, let's put it this way, because UIs have, have always will have those sort of limitations of what they can show you and what you can manage through them. While in command line, this is like just Linux, right? And you can do whatever you want. So this is my preferred way of doing it. Um, that doesn't mean it's the only way, obviously, but um, I will be able to tell you only about this essentially. Okay, there we go. So Docker is nearly installed. It's 17.2, I believe it's the same as I have here. Um, it's a good question. Yeah, 17.2, so this is the latest one. Um, obviously no fancy UI here, but we don't really care about it. Um, come on, Linux headers. If you have any questions, as usual, along the way, feel free to ask them in the chat. I am looking from time to time there and be happy to answer them. Okay, there we go. There's our sockets. There's set up for our sync and other stuff. Almost there. And we're done. Okay, so theoretically, if we run this, we should see hello world. So, okay, so we connected to Docker socket, it pulls the image, and there we go, works. So now the problem is um, I have to run it with sudo, right? Which is not perfect. So, first of all, it means that we have to elevate the rights every time. Second of all, it's just not convenient. So, I'm gonna say user mods adds uh, to group Docker myself, right? So I'm adding myself to the Docker group, which means now I can say Docker PS, uh, I have to re-log in, I think. But now I'm in a Docker group, which is actually allowed to access socket without the rights elevation. So there you go. Now we have direct access to Docker. We install the Docker and that's actually 90% of basically what you need to do with the server. So fail to ban Docker and um, public key authentication for SSH. So what's left to do, um, let me just have a quick look at the chat. Topic where you feel confident. Ah, that's a good thing. That's yes, yes, Renato. <laughs> okay, so final thing to do is basically configure a proxy that will um, handle the routing between the front end and whatever your whatever services you deploy, right? So there are two options, Nginx proxy, um, Docker Nginx proxy, so I, yes, it's, it's called Nginx proxy. So it's automated Nginx proxy for Docker based on the same pack, like the, the Docker gen package from the same guy. Um, it works, I mean, it's an Nginx basically with auto writing configs. It works fine, uh, but somewhat limited with the configs and it does not work well with uh, Swarm or any distributed sort of um, deployments, right? I think there is a way to make it work, but it's kind of pain in ass. Um, it does have also the, 
nginx proxy let's uh let, let come on let's encrypt so it does have the companion package that you can use to enable let's encrypt by default as well but there's like a few additional steps to set it up essentially nothing wrong about that i've used it for quite some time i think more than one year and it was fine but uh, there is actually a much better solution in my opinion there's a thing called traffic it's written in golang and it's really really good it's written to work in docker swarm kubernetes whatever you can imagine basically right all of those container apis and it has a way more flexible configuration so what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually start traffic so i'm gonna show you how to do it first manually and then how to use exoframe to save a lot of time for that so um we are gonna run traffic and um in this case we're gonna run it in docker mode right um wait a second there should be a user guide for docker configuration examples maybe no this is not what we want let's encrypt in docker there we go so yeah um first of all yes we need to create a network that will be basically uh, where you would connect the containers that would need access to the external web, right? And then we need some folder with uh, traffic config. So in this case, let's just put it here in the home YAML lights because whatever. We are gonna, yes, we are gonna touch Docker Compose YAML. Once again, traffic has a pretty good docs, uh, so you can, uh, pretty much go through that yourself if you want to so we're going to create acme json this is going to be our storage for um, acme certificates and we're going to create traffic no i don't think we're going to create traffic tumble because i don't care about that right so we're going to vim docker compose and i'm going to just copy this it whoa what the okay that did not go <laughs> whoa Okay, I am not sure why it pasted it this way, but um, let me just delete all of that. Let us, <laughs> let us copy this line by line. So version two, why not CS services, right? We're gonna have a web services. Yes. Um, okay, I think there is some autocomplete going on around here, which doesn't seem to be working exactly very good gonna say traffic latest I was in this case we don't really care about version I'm gonna say restart always yes so the restart policy will basically mean that uh, we're gonna be restarting whenever it crashes there seem to be questions in the chat um, uh, yes I do use Bulma quite frequently um, HTTPS with traffic yes uh, it has integrated let's encrypt support and we're gonna set it up right now it's um, I, at least I'm going to show you how to set it up because it's not going to work because the server is not public. But basically, it's very easy to configure. And uh, my website, for example, so this codezen.net, if you go here, you see this HTTPS. It actually has the Let's Encrypt certificate, and this works through traffic. Okay. Um, da -da 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 -da. HTTP2 support is there as well. Um, and. Um, I'm too lazy to configure Vim right now, so we're just gonna go with, you know, basic own config, right? So we got ports. We need to con uh, to pipe 80 to 80. So essentially, traffic takes uh, the role of um, HTTP server, right? So it's gonna occupy the port 8080 and oh, sorry, port 80 and port 443, which is the um, HTTPS port for both right um we're gonna say it's gonna be in a network networks um it put it so much to the right side there's definitely something wrong with the config okay so we're gonna put it to the network volumes um did i misspell it yes i did okay uh and now with the volumes we have to basically connect our first of all we need to pipe the docker socket because it will ask the docker in its own and figure out which containers have to be proxied var run docker sock right and i think we connected to the same var run docker sock uh, next thing we need to do is we need to say home yamalite um traffic what was it traffic no we, we don't have traffic tumble right so um, it was Acme JSON to Acme JSON. 
and uh, that's actually it i think container name we don't care to be honest so now we need to come on stop doing this vim that works web and we're going to say that this is just an external web uh, external network true right okay um so the thing is that we actually have to define config in this case this is going to be done through commands um doing this um and i think okay traffic um so i am gonna wait a second traffic flags so there's basically two ways of defining traffic configuration Way number one, you can do it using the traffic tumble, which is fine and works. You know, you can you can do it like this. I mean, I guess we can do it through tumble as well because why the hell not? So I'm gonna hit this, um, save it, and we can touch. Yeah, traffic tumble. Basically, the thing is that uh, most of the time you can also define exactly the same config using um, what do you call it? Uh, using f uh, like command line flags. So when you launch it, okay, I'm gonna use nano because it probably won't screw up my pasting. There we go. Okay, now let's see traffic tumble uh, default entry point. So, okay. So this config here includes, um, we are not gonna be doing that. So we have, what was the domain name that I used? Debian VM, right, Debian VM. Okay, um, which exposed by default, we're going to set this to true just for the purpose of the demo. Um, your email, yeah, so this is like additional. So this is the, this Acme thing is essentially the uh, let's encrypt config. And in this case, I am actually going to remove all of that because it's not going to work and um, my IP going to get banned for, you know, repeated failed attempts to actually do that. So um there is additional things here so first of all there's this entry point http redirect this enables redirect from http to https what you normally want in production i'm going to kill that as well and i'm going to kill the https definition too so we're only going to be working on http and we also don't need the https entry point here so it's a very simple config in this case and i think yeah we don't really need anything else here so we can edit uh, docker compose and uh, actually volume now, we don't actually need Acme JSON, right? Because we don't use the HTTPS here in this case. So traffic um, tumble. I think it is just traffic tumble, right? Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Have a look. Just traffic tumble. Yes, it is just traffic tumble. Okay. So run that. Save it. And now we say Docker compose up minus D, right? Uh, right, okay sudo apt get install docker compose i'm always forgetting that docker compose does not come as a package of that's a part of docker even you have to install it separately let me have a look at the chat uh hello katerin um i am not making a server i'm configuring a server uh setting up everything from scratch essentially and now i just finished configuring docker now we're setting up traffic as a front end for web development um, not necessarily for Docker deployment, but yes, primarily for Docker deployment. Okay, so Docker compose up minus D, we should, so it will now pull the traffic image actually. And uh, the image is tiny, by the way, since traffic is written in Golang, it results in a very small binary and uh, the container is also very, very small. So we can have a look, Docker logs minus F, we can check that logs are fine. Okay, so it doesn't crash. So in theory, if I go now to uh, whoops, no. Um, so HTTP slash slash Debian dot VM, this is my local address, we can actually see 404. This is the page from the traffic that says, hey, nothing is found, right? Um, so here's how you actually run things with traffic. So we're going to run a simple um, Nginx container. So we're going to say nginx latest, right? And uh, what you need to do to make it exposed to the world is just add traffic frontend rule here, right? So this is this is actually the only thing that is interesting for us 
everything else is additional config options that are optional. And I'm going to say Debian VM, right? So because we don't have anything occupying that port. And once I start that, so it's obviously going to pull the Nginx image. Once it starts it, if I did not screw anything up, we should actually see Nginx on this page instead of 404. I might be forgetting something, but I don't think I do. So you can optionally like set the ports, protocols, uh, network, probably. Oh yeah, I forgot to, yeah, okay. That won't work actually. Docker stop um, brave care. Yes, let's remove that. So I forgot to specify the network, right? So we need to say uh, net uh, web network. I'm always forgetting the flags. I think it's network. There we go. Okay, so theoretically, Nginx now works, right? So this is literally all you have to do to run uh, Docker containers behind the proxy, right? There are obviously additional options that allow you to specify from uh, like more complex rules, ports, protocols, whatever you can, but you can even have like load balancing, multiple backends and so on and so forth. Um, so the cool thing is that, for example, we can stop this um, Nginx again, right? Uh, stop it, remove it. So now we get for get 404. But the cool thing is that um, traffic actually supports partial routing. So you can say that I want I want it. Um, where was the guide user guides configuration um, entry points? I think it was here. No, it's not here. Common. Um, what's the name of it? Front end tool, right? Um, what was it? Where the hell was they driving that? Ah, rules. Yes, there you go. So yeah, so you can actually say host and path and then yeah, oh, you can combine it. There you go. That's how you do it. So and then we can say that it's going to be under path slash test, right? And uh, if I run it, we should theoretically still see 404 here. But if I request test, um, obviously, it's going to be rooted in the same way to Nginx. So Nginx should have this slash test there. But you can actually see that the request goes to Nginx, which is really cool. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop the dazzling Thompson. The names of those containers sometimes are ridiculous. Okay, so this is the super basic. Um, what? Wait, wait a second. Let me have a look at chat. Don't ignore my message. Which message? Um, can you do set paste? Ah, okay. I see. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I'm too lazy. <laughs> all right. So this is the very basic setup. And in theory, that's all you need to get your containers running, right? So you can basically then push your containers to the server and start them. Or alternatively, you can configure the uh, certificate authentication for your Docker and expose the sockets. But all of that is not very convenient. So um, I'm not sure if you've seen the project. I've had a video on it before on the channel, and I think I don't did not stream it on Twitch yet. But I built a project called Exoframe that allows a very, very, very simple deployment of projects right from the command line from your machine to the server directly, right? It's super easy to set up. So once you have Docker, I'm going to kill all the things that we have here. So I'm going to say Docker stop traffic i'm gonna remove uh that's too many traffic so i'm gonna remove that i go here um i'm gonna remove the traffic folder here right and that's so that's it we're gonna go to the um traffic exoframe server so this is what you need to run on your server it's a docker image you can really literally run it with one command well, this is all you need i'm gonna fire up vs code here um, I think it's going to open one of my work projects. Uh, yes, it will. So I'm going to open a new window. No, thank you very much. File new window. There we go. Close that. That is all super tiny. So let me make it bigger. So this is the command that will run Exoframe, right? So there is a bunch of things you will have to configure. First of all, you need to provide the your Docker socket because it manages Docker containers. Second of all, you need to provide the pass to Exoframe config. So in this case, we're going to say Yamalite home, uh, so home Yamalite Exoframe. I'm going to call it .exoframe. So I'm going to make dear .exoframe. 
gonna CD into it. Uh, next thing is you need to link it with your SSH authorized keys because it also uses uh, private and public key authentication. So you don't have to configure anything as, um, else for Auth. Um, the theme on VS Code, so the question from chat, what theme on VS Code I have is, um, where is it? Material icon theme for icons and um, what the hell was the name of it? Preference color theme, one dark pro. Yes, there we go, this one. I think it's it's a copy of material theme for Sublime or something like this. It's pretty nice. Okay, um, right, let us continue. So then you said the private key, which is used for encrypting all your sessions and everything. So we're just gonna say Debian VM tests. It, it can be whatever you want. So basically it has to be unique and long enough. Uh, so we're gonna say it's a backend Exoframe server and we're gonna say host is gonna be Exoframe Debian VM, right? And that's it. So I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna run that here. Obviously it's not gonna find the Exoframe server image. It's gonna pull it. It's not big enough as well. So it's like 40 or 50 megs. It is Node.js app uh, in there. So uh, it does have some weight to it at least, but I've tried to optimize it as much as I could. So it's you know quite fast and quite small. So once the Exaframe server is pulled, it will start the server and server will in order start auto configured traffic instance. So the cool thing is that here, if you wanna enable Let's Encrypt, you can just, um, so this will create, come on, server config. And we can actually cut that. And you can see here that you can enable Let's Encrypt by just setting this to true and then specifying your email as an administrator. That's all you need. You can also enable or disable compression, which will automatically gzip whatever comes through it. And there as well, some additional config options that are, you might not even need them, right? So now if we go to Exoframe Debian VM, we actually will see web, nah, no, come on. On the HTTP, thank you very much. You actually see that this is Exoframe powered page now, right? So here's how it works. Now here I have Exoframe command line tool. Whoops, no, that is not what I want. Version, there we go. So this is my obviously development branch, but you know, whatever. So we can actually go to Exaframe project and uh, say server. So I have some test projects here. So here, we'll, for example, we have a Node.js project, right? I can open it in VS Code to show you how it looks. So it's a very basic project. It just uses the um, nodes HTTP package to serve hello world, right? So, but it is a node project. So it requires a Node.js to run. Now, here's the cool thing. So I can say exaframe endpoint right now, and I can actually um, pick between multiple. So we want to add new one, right? Exoframe Debian VM, right? So we add a new endpoint, and now we log in into it. So login will ask us, okay, I am Yamalite, and I want to use my uh, IDES key. I believe that actually won't work because it needs uh, RSA key. So we need to edit this slightly. SSH, authorized keys. So we need to add my RSA key because unfortunately the um, ED keys are not supported by, oh, by Node.js uh, crypto module yet, I think. So I think they do have a plans for, uh, to add that support. Uh, once they do that, I obviously will support that as well. Okay, so now we have authorized keys enabled so we can log in again. The same YAML line, I'm gonna to point to my RSA key and I'm gonna enter my passphrase for one. I guess it needs to be restarted to reload the uh, authorized keys files. Docker restart exoframe server, right? After that, I think we should be able to log in unless I screwed something up royally. <laughs> Hopefully shouldn't. Come on. Okay, we got to go from server running, cool. And I think we should be able to log in right now. So I dare say my password and we're logged in. So you can actually now use Exaframe LS to see all the deployments, which we obviously don't have. 
here's the cool bit. So we have our project, right? Uh, which has package JSON and index.js. So package JSON specifies that the start script is node index. So all I have to do to deploy that now on a server is just say exaframe. They will package all folder and send it to server, build a new Docker uh, image out of it, start it, and assign whatever the uh, domain name you want. So in this case, I actually forgot to change the domain and set to localhost, which obviously won't work. So let's say we're going to be demo DBN VM, right? And uh, it's obviously going to take some time to build it first time because it has to pull the Node.js image, which is not there. So it's like, you know, taking some time. But the rebuilds, when, once I uh, show you uh, in a second when we push the new config, you will see that the redeployments are quite damn fast. And um, come on. And probably have a look at the okay it doesn't actually it's not in a debug mode so we can't actually see the progress but as you can see here come on what's going on Pervious my say come on where's my where's my stuff let me interrupt it and i'm gonna run it in a verbs mode just to see what the hell's going on so, okay, there we go. Yeah, there you go, as you can see. So it's actually downloading the Node.js image, which is not there. For some reason, it's not exactly fast. I mean, I have like 400 megabit connection there, so usually it happens very quickly, but maybe the streaming is interrupting with it, but I don't know. Anyway, so once it downloads the image, I will show you the update uh, phase as well, which is also really cool, I think, and some other minor features of Exaframe. Okay, so it downloads the base image for Node.js and then it will build, there you go. So it creates the, basically the Docker image for this is uh, sort of best, follows the best practices so you don't have to think about that as long as you expose the server on port 80 and uh, specify the start script. And now we can actually just click this and see our hello world demo. Now here's the cool part. So say you want to change something, right? So you want, okay, I want to say hello one to three. And what you can do is you can just say exaframe minus U and that will update the deployment. So it actually will rebuild the image, start a new version and then tear down the old one in a way that makes this um, almost seamless, right? So there is near zero downtime and that's slightly configurable in the config. So if you want a complete zero downtime, you can uh, also do that. So another cool thing is that you can say exaframe token, which will generate a deployment token, deploy test, for example, uh, you will get this token one time. So you cannot see it again, you have to save it somewhere is the same way GitHub tokens work. And the cool thing is that um, even if you are not logged in, so for example, this is useful for uh, continuous de delivery, right? Continuous deployment, actually. What you can say is you can say minus u. Um, so we can say hello world. So we redeploy it again with the basic stuff. And then you can say minus t and then you give this token. And instead of using your login password or certificate or whatever, it will actually authenticate using this token. And this can be done basically so you can encrypt this token and save it in Travis CI and then deploy using tokens, all right? So you can actually see the new version and it will be deployed from uh, GitHub, for example. So if we go to github.com, I think I do have a demo set up like this. Um, there is exaframe. Yes, there you go. So I did a video on it actually. Continuous delivery demo and there is a video. So we have deployment right here. And if you have a look at the Travis YAML, this is actually what it does. So you, you encrypt this token. This is the secure encrypted thing environmental variable. And you can you know publicly share it and nobody will know how to do that but you because the uh, Travis encryption is pretty good. Like they, they tie it to the um, repository. So yes, um, exaframe less. Obviously you can, you know, see logs for your deployment. So you can check the name and yeah, there you go. There's our logs. You can remove it if you don't want it anymore. And all of that happens in Docker. So if you like physically look at the Docker containers, you'll actually see all of that. But the Exaframe manages all of that for you. Um, 
git checkout had let me just reset that real quick because I screwed up uh, and I will forget about that and then wonder why my test fails. Okay, um, I think that's basically all I wanted to show with regards to the server setup. This is how I set up my servers essentially. So if you, um, yeah, like as I already pointed out, like code Zen, for example, is, is example of the infrastructure like this. So um, I will exit this and I will say exaframe endpoint. So you, exaframe allows you to have multiple servers. So you can actually choose one of them. So for example, this is one, uh, the code Zen one, right? So you can see I have like a bunch of demos here. You can just click on one of them and see, okay, here's the website, you know, right away. Um, that's basically it. So I don't really have anything else to add. If you guys have any questions in the chat, feel free to ask. Otherwise, let me just comment uh, what I did. So do not use root user, use uh, pop key auth, setup fail to ban, setup docker, Set up Priafic or set up Exaframe. Uh, let's me let's let's put it this way. Um, alternatively, set up Exaframe. That looks about right. Um, let me maybe put the links once again. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We'll be happy to answer. So fail to ban um, Docker. Probably just Docker com would do, right? And we got Triific. Come on, Triific. There we go. And we got Exoframe. Exoframe. Probably should make a website for it. Uh, PubKey Auth, I think GitHub. Um, no, I guess SSH public key. There should be a guide from SSH itself, right? And that's a git thing. Setting up that. Oh, there's a wait a second. Was it a DigitalOcean one? Come on. How do you gonna? Yeah, there you go. DigitalOcean is always good, as I said. They have incredible documentation. And uh, yeah, looks good. Um, do I have a Docker tutorial for complete beginners? I mean, I did a video on Docker. Um, wait a second. It was part of the course that I did, but there is basically, uh, da, 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 wait a second. It was in the older ones. Is it here? Is that the, yes. So there is, yes, this one. So it's, it kind of, there's not just Docker here, but, um, I do explain basically how it works and how to use it and what is image, how to build and so on and so forth. So I guess you could start here. On the other hand, I can like literally the Docker docs are really good. Like there are some more advanced bits missing from there, but they're getting started. Uh, guide is very good. And there is as well this try Docker thing. Um, no, it's not, not this, not code school. I think, oh, come on. But car, oh, come on, doc, try Docker. I, I think it was from the Docker guys themselves. Was it this one? Um, my scripts are probably blocking everything. Try it. Frames. Ah, try, yeah, that's not very helpful, Docker. Come on, is it ad block blocking everything? For reals, okay, let me let me try Safari. Maybe Safari works. Where's my Safari? There we go. Um, yeah, I guess that doesn't work. Okay, wait a second. I'll find it. There was play with Docker. There was some like interactive command line thing online, basically, which you can just try. Um, self-paced, get docker, what the hell? Did they close it? For reals, online, yes, there was a thing. 
Is that the code school? Really? The course. No, that's a course, right? That's not what you want. Uh, come on. Awesome Docker. Play with Docker, sloppy IO. No, this is some hosting service. Okay. Well, basically, I like maybe we try. No registry. I what was a play with play with Docker. Okay, get started. Oh, okay. So I guess this is the basics. Docker for beginners. Linux. Oh, okay. There you go. So okay, they just made it way more complex, I guess. So there you go. I will share it in the chat as well. It's basically a guided tutorial that will uh, show you the. Um, okay, let me just enable scripts for them. They actually show you the shell. I'm not sure if that's like a proper uh, full command line, full server somewhere, or just emulate it. But if you log in, you will actually be able to type in shell commands and see bash here and see the results of your command, which is kind of great. I did it at some point. It did not require a login back at, at that time, but I think it's worse basically probably using all with, okay, it actually, you, oh, it's official Docker thing. Okay. Um, so where's my login? Yes, there we go. Yeah, there you go. So you can see you can actually, it's, it seems to be like a proper VM. So it's a pretty good tutorial. Okay, um, any other questions? Any other things you guys wanna know? Something that I was not explaining clearly enough? Or yeah, anything else you wanna know about server setup? If not, then I think we are done for today. That was uh, pretty quick, I guess. I mean, one hour, that's a good time, I think, for a server setup. Obviously, you could automate all of that. And if I would not need to explain what we're doing, that will be like twice as fast, I guess. Because, uh, yeah, it's like setting up Docker is not an extremely complicated thing to do. <laughs> um, I will be doing a recap video on that. Um, may, yeah, I guess I will. I'm not sure if I want to do a recap or I will just crop the relevant parts from the video that we did today. Because I feel like I don't really need to retake it. A lot of a lot of things I already said most of what I wanted to say. I'm just going to like crop the summary and uh, I think we're good here. All right, doesn't really seem like there are any other questions here. So I guess thank you for watching. Uh, do not forget that you can vote on other topics that I will live stream and cover. So uh, there's like high availability sockets, Windows 10 is development system, AI discussion, which I think we're gonna have some guests for that once it comes to the point where you guys are mostly interested in that. ID configuration, accessibility, internationalization, open source contribution to Exoframe, Firebase game, image processing, React and Bulma, and all of that stuff. So basically, go ahead, go to the GitHub, uh, vote for the proposals that you like. Um, the link to the proposals, by the way, is under the Twitch. If you're watching this on Twitch, and if you're watching on YouTube, it should be in the video description. That's basically it. Um, Thank you for watching guys and I see you next time. Bye bye. I'm gonna slowly awkwardly stop the stream <laughs> because I forgot to switch off again. Hey, <laughs> okay, see you guys.